Turn your Bibles, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 43. Oh, he's good. The Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. Isaiah 43 and verse 18. Uh, I do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. How many of you believe he's doing a new thing? Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. And like I say, what does it matter if there's a wilderness and a desert? If you've got a road and a river. Just going right through the middle of it. Amen. Uh, this is an important message in the word of God. The NIV says, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? The, the new living, uh, I love this, but forget all that. It is nothing compared to what I'm going to do. So this is a, a, a resounding message in the word of God. It has everything to do with advancing in the kingdom of God on earth. And the reason it's so important is this. If you, if you don't get it, uh, it can paralyze you from moving forward. Not only can, can the bad things hold you captive, but also the good things. You know, you hear people talk, whoo, the good old days. I was at, uh, uh, we were back at Rama. Roy and Jill, Annie were there. Sophia and I went to uh, their winter Bible seminar. And uh, uh, my first one was 40 years ago. And boy, I, I just, memories flooded me of the times that we had. And there were some people there that uh, didn't seem like they were doing so hot. And they said, man, remember the times we used to have? And I thought, I do remember them. But these are the best times I've ever had. <laughs> It's getting better and brighter to me. This is our best days, amen? And so uh, Isaiah said, forget all that. Now, turn, if you would, to Philippians chapter, uh, uh, Philippians chapter 3 and verse 13. This is what the Apostle Paul said. I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. Now, this is interesting because he has had some amazing things happen. Earth-shattering things have happened. Historic things have happened that God used Paul in. He said, forgetting those things which are behind, forget all that stuff, and reach forward to the things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I, I love the King James. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The, the New Living says, I focus on one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. God's Word translation, this is what I do, I don't look back. Boy, that's pretty good, isn't it? I mean, that's as plain as you can get. And then he says, I lengthen my stride. And then last week, uh, everyone in here that was in that service memorized the Scripture. Last week, from Luke 17, 32... It's a long one, remember? Remember Lot's wife. And Jesus made that statement. Uh, there's only one thing we know about her, only one thing she looked back. We don't even know her name. <laughs> That's all we know is she looked back. And Jesus said, don't you forget it. This one verse, remember Lot's wife. Well, that's the same thing that Paul said in Philippians. That's the same thing that Isaiah said. And so uh, they're, they're telling us the same thing. It's a resounding theme for people who walk by faith. What is ahead is greater. Now, over in Habakkuk 2, and we've been uh, looking at this scripture. Uh, uh, we've looked at this a few times. In verse 2, then the Lord answered me and said. Now, this is instructions on exactly how to do that. Write the vision. Also, the same word is revelation. And make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end, it will speak and it will not lie. Though it hesitates, is the original word, wait for it because it will surely come and it will not be late, is what that word means there. Though it hesitates, how many of you know a hesitate, hesitation is not even really a stop, it's like a comma, it's like a yield sign. 
So it's coming. This isn't a dead stop. This is just a hesitation because it surely is coming. And it says appointed time. That is Moab. That's a, a, a fixed time. So this is an appointment with God if you keep it. It's 100% uh, uh, dependent on if you keep it. But God has a time and he has a place for this thing to come to pass in your life. But he said you need to write the vision and make it plain that you may run who reads it. So you can see that your best days are not behind you. Your best days are ahead of you. Uh, where, where we've been is not even worth comparing to where we are going. Now in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and, and verse 18, it said, and all of us have had the veil removed so that we can be mirrors that brightly reflect the glory of the Lord. As the Spirit of the Lord works within us, we become more and more like him and reflect his glory even more. Now, this is referring to Moses in Exodus 34. He was with God. Uh, uh, he, he was in the presence of God. And when he came down from being in the presence of God, he was glowing Physically, his face was glowing, and the Bible says beams of light were shooting out of his face, and it freaked them all out, and he had to put a veil over his face to even talk to the people because they were afraid. They freaked him out, and that's what this veil is talking about. All of us have had the veil removed so that we can brightly reflect the glory of the Lord as the Spirit of the Lord. This says works within us. What he had on the outside, we have on the inside. The, the same glory that caused beams of light to shoot out of his face, we have that same kind of glory on the inside of us. That's a type and a shadow of what we have today. Now listen to verse 10 in the New Living Translation of the same chapter. In fact, the first glory that caused him to glow was not glorious at all compared with the overwhelming glory of the new way, what we're walking in. Verse 11, so if the old way which has been replaced was glorious, how much more glorious is the new which remains forever? Well, the Amplified says from one degree of glory to the next degree of glory. Amen. And so what they had on the outside uh, where Moses' skin shone, we as New Testament believers have on the inside. So God's plan is amazing. His way is to just get better and better. Not weaker, not lesser. That's the world system. So, uh, you, know, you know you can be a believer and it not even show up in your life. Most Christians, uh, you wouldn't even know they are. What do you mean? Well, they get mad when the world gets mad. Get upset when the world gets upset, you know, gets in fear when the world gets in fear, complain when the world complains, and sick when the world's sick. And to most Christians, their salvation has to do with when they leave the planet and move to heaven. They have no more victory than the world, and really don't even believe that they can, or they're supposed to. So he, he did not just put you on this planet and say, okay, y'all just do your best to get by. I'll be back to get you later. <laughs> but that's how most Christians live. He came that we might have life, this is Jesus' own words, and have it more abundantly to the full until it overflows. So God ha has blessed us for here and now, not the sweet by and by. Because he said, while you're on the earth, be fruitful, multiply, subdue, and take dominion. He told us to do all that, and he gave us everything we need to do to do it. He's given us his grace. Now, grace is an interesting word. Everybody say grace. grace. Many people think, you know, that's sort of an abstract word. Grace means different things to different people. It's kind of hard to describe. It's, it's beautiful. Well, actually, none of that's really true. It, it's, it's not some abstract thing that's left up to interpretation. It's very concrete. And we're confused because of how we use it in our vernacular today. We, we use, use it to describe something uh, flowy and beautiful. Oh, the, she's so graceful. Well, grace doesn't mean that. 
It's not a beautiful word. It's a strong word. It's not a soft word. Grace, everybody say grace. It's an enablement or an empowerment. It's something that can come on you to make something that would be hard easier. And Paul describes it in 1 Corinthians 15. In the Amplified Translation, of verse 10, it says, But by the grace, the unmerited favor and blessing of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not found to be for nothing, fruitless and without effect. This is interesting. In fact, I worked harder than all of them, the apostles, though it was not really I, but the grace, the unmerited favor, and the blessing of God which was with me. Wow. So this grace is like a superpower that comes on you only by faith. You obtain it by faith, and it's an enablement or an empowerment that comes on you to do things that you could not do without it. When it kicks in, it is like from Clark Kent to Superman. And most people don't get Superman until they get to heaven. And they're just Clark Kent their whole life. <laughs> but you're not supposed to be Clark Kent your whole life. You're supposed to be Superman down here. We're supposed to be walking in super. All of the, this whole thing is for down here. This is, a, this is our instruction manual for down here. Amen. And so this grace is absolutely amazing. Glory to God. So grace, everybody say grace, grace. is God's part. Faith is our part. Paul used his faith to get this grace. And he said, I worked harder than all of them, and yet it really wasn't even me. A grace of God came on me to do it. You know you can have a grace come on you to do your job and just make it easy. Makes hard things easy. Anyone could have it, but he did it. He got it. Now, look at this over in 2 Corinthians uh, 9, 8. We looked at this, at this verse. Uh, actually, in all of uh, uh, chapters 8 and 9, we've studied quite a bit of these out. The whole thing is talking about their giving and about financial prosperity. That's what the whole subject is. And God is able, verse 8, to make all grace abound toward you, that you always, and now he's describing what it's like when you have this grace abounding, you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. Amen. Wow. That's amazing. Listen to the Amplified. And God is able to make all grace, and he describes it, every favor and earthly blessing. Earthly. Earthly blessing. Come on you in abundance, so that you may always, and under all circumstances, and whatever the need, be self-sufficient, possessing enough to require no aid or support, and furnish in abundance for every good work and charitable donation. Wow. That's absolutely amazing. And he's talking here about financial and material ability. Earthly blessing. He's able to make all this earthly blessing come on you. So he has a grace for every area of our life. And the result of this grace abounding, he wants, you, he wants it to abound, is this. We always having all sufficiency in all things. Man, there's certainly no lack in there. There's certainly no just getting by in there. That's abundance. That is life more abundantly. Just like everything else, uh, let me just say this. There are people uh, that are going to get off and people whose motives aren't right. You know, when it comes to uh, uh, prosperity and, and things like that. But that doesn't do away with the truth. You know, how many of you know you can have a plumber with bad motives? <laughs> that, and that's a crook. But, that, you know, when, when the sink stopped up or when we've got problems, we don't just say, oh, I'm not calling a plumber. They're all crooks. They're not all crooks. Just that crazy when you hired. If you were listening to the Holy Ghost, you wouldn't have hired him anyway. Because <laughs> he wants to lead you the right ones. I didn't plan on saying that, but it's good anyway. <laughs> a lot of it has to do with us for not listening. But uh, that doesn't do away with plumbers because somebody's a crook. You know, uh, so people are, yeah, but prosperity, some people are off. Well, people are off on everything. 
You have a book. God gave you that book. And he gave you the Holy Spirit. And he gave you a pastor. So you wouldn't be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine like it says in Ephesians chapter 4. So when you hear the word preached... Because you have the Spirit of God on the inside of you, your heart bears witness with what, with what is right. It's like a light comes on when you hear it. When you hear the word uh, preached and you know it's the word, I mean, it just brightens you up on the inside. Well, the Bible says the anointing teaches us. That's what it says in 1 John. I, I'm, I'm a vessel and he flows through me, but he takes even what I say and begins to teach you. So there's more going on than just me teaching. He'll even, he'll even speak and reveal things to you beyond what I say. It's supernatural. The Holy Spirit is our teacher. And, and the anointing enlightens your eyes and it opens up your heart and opens up your mind. And in his presence, you'll just begin to see things and know things and understand things. Now, turn to John 10.10. 10. Now, uh, we go over a lot of these same scriptures because uh, I'm not here to tell you something new today. I'm here to come along, kick you in the backside, and get you to act on what you've already been here and already been knowing. And I was thinking about this because this is a John 10, 10. Most of us can quote this, if you're around here, can quote this by heart. But it's amazing how God can take that when you hear it and, and uh, make something come alive to you that maybe you've never even seen before. I was, I was thinking about that because being back at Raymond, I, I was uh, looking at some old videos, you know. Uh, I don't know if I said that. I used to travel with Brother Hagan, used to sing with him. And I'll still be looking at old videos, uh, of, and I still feed on that stuff. And I was looking, you know, I, I first went there 40 years ago. And I was looking at a service from 40 years ago, and w I, it was absolutely amazing. And I thought, man, I've never heard him say that. And it wasn't just a few seconds. The camera panned across, and there I sat. Well, I, I was there when he said it. But I'm not the same person I was 40 years ago. I can hear things I heard. I can be in a meeting. Uh, I was at a meeting with Mark Hankins last year, and I was listening to it again the other day, and he said something, and I thought, oh, I've never heard that before. I was sitting there when he said it. But I'm not even the same person I was last year. Because of what we just read, we're moving from one level of glory to the next level of glory. And when you get on this level, as you grow and you grow in the word, uh, he'll, he'll start revealing things and it changes you into a different person. And you see things you've never seen before because you are not the same. John 10.10 10 says, the thief does, uh, does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they have it, may have it more abundantly. Now, you hear lots of people say lots of things, but how about we go back to the source? What did G Why did Jesus say that he came? You can easily see here in Jesus' own words who is behind stealing, killing, and destruction. In Jesus' words. Uh, uh, because you will hear believers say all the time, telling how God did something, and then they'll describe something that has to do with stealing, killing, or destroying. Jesus said here, that isn't true. You know, that, and then they'll say, well, maybe God had a purpose in it. You know, he's mysterious, and, we don't, and their eyes get kind of freaky, kind of freaks you out a little bit. <laughs> maybe he had a purpose in it. Not true. Jesus said that's impossible. He will never violate his word. That, that's deception, and it's a lie, and it's trickery. God doesn't use a devil to teach you stuff. He, some people act like God has a devil on a leash, and every once in a while he goes, sick him. That'll teach him. He doesn't. Let me tell you, let me tell you something about the devil. He, the devil is self-employed. He doesn't work for God. And God never steals, kills, and destroys. That is not his way. The Amplified says, the thief comes only in order to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have and enjoy life. You're supposed to be enjoying this. And have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. Why? Well, I'm sure uh, we've been going through it. We're not enjoying it. Then you're not doing it right. 
Because Jesus said you're supposed to enjoy it and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. So this, the Amplified is trying to describe this one Greek word abundantly. And it says have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. The New King James says more abundantly. But that's not enough to describe it because this word abundantly, parasos, this is what it means. Beyond excessive. Now, most Christians act like excess is a bad word. This is beyond excessive. Superior in quality, superabundant in quantity, beyond a measure is what that word means. Well, he, I, I'm telling you, he is the God who will run your cup over. When he multiplied the loaves and, and fishes, didn't God know how much it would take to feed all those people? Why would they have 12 baskets left over? I mean, that's too much if you got 12 baskets left over. Well, that was the will of God and God doing. You know, you know what the will of God is? Too much. More than enough overflow. Well, you know, I believe God will just supply what we need. It just, he, and nothing more. Well, then you don't believe this. You don't believe more abundantly to the full till it overflows, like Jesus said then you don't believe exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think. You can either believe him and his word or believe your religious tradition. You know, people, people really actually get mad sometimes when you preach it, when you preach prosperity. One guy said, boy, I don't like when you preach this. And I said, which verse didn't you like? Because I didn't write, this was here before I was born. I didn't write any of this. Do you not like the verse that says he wants to give to you exceedingly abundantly above all you can ask or think? Or maybe you didn't like the one where Jesus told Peter to launch out into the deep for a catch and he got so many fish that his net started breaking. He called his partnerships and they started filling their boats up with, uh, with the fish and it got so much that their boats started sinking. Maybe that's the one you don't like. Or the one where he said, I came that you might have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. Which one don't you like? Which verse do you have a problem with? Now, think about this little boy's lunch. Two fish, five pieces of bread, you know, and that fed 5,000 plus women and children. That is, some people have trouble with a hundredfold return when you talk about that. This is anywhere from 30,000, the best we could estimate, to 50,000 fold return. I mean, why, why, why wouldn't this multiplication have just stopped when everybody got full? Because he came that we might have life and have it to the full until it overflows. Now, this is interesting. Philippians 4, I'm almost done. Philippians 4, and I like verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Now, he wrote this. Paul wrote this from the, from the um, Mermertine prison. And he talks about rejoicing 19 times in this one letter that he wrote. He's in chains in prison. Rejoice in the Lord always. And I'll say it again for those in the back. Rejoice. So you can see joy is not a result of what happens to you, but it's a decision that you make. So it is a choice. Now, verse 5, I'm going to read out of the King James Version for a, a, a specific reason. It says, let your moderation be known to all men, the Lord is at hand. Now, many have taken from this verse, this phrase, everything in moderation. And they'll say, the Bible teaches everything in moderation. Well, first of all, when they say everything in moderation, what exactly do they mean? So here's what the word moderate. Everybody say moderate. moderate. Now, this is not what this verse means. I'm going to show you that in just a second. This is what moderate means, moderation. This is the definition. Average, mediocre, limited. I get mad just reading uh, those definitions. I don't want anything to do with that. Say, to tell you the truth, saved or not saved, I don't want anything to do with any of that. Not expensive, I hate that one. <laughs> not too much, not too little, just moderate. Everything in moderation. But that's not what this verse says. Je Jesus came that you might have life and have it moderately. 
have it limited. Average, mediocre. Don't get carried away. You know, we don't want to be, we don't want to be too healed. You don't, don't get, we don't want to be too blessed. We don't want to be too peaceful. Mo moderately blessed. Moderately free. Moderately anointed. That's not true. Moderately healed. He wants you so healed that healing is splashing off of you onto other people. What kind of God did Abraham know? Did you ever read the, uh, read the Bible? God gave him too many cows, too many camels, too many donkeys. What kind of God did Peter know? So many fish they couldn't get him in the boat. The nets broke. He called his partners. They started, uh, put, it, put it in their boats. It started to sink. And you'd think God would know the maximum capacity of those boats. I mean... He should know that and should know how strong the nets are. The God who made the universe should know these things. Why would he give, give Abraham and Lot so many cows? The Bible says they didn't have room to graze them. There were so many of them. I mean, this is your father. You ought to get to know him. God, this is too many cows. And he says, that's not my problem. That's your problem. Here, here's some more cows. That's, how, that's just how he does it. Is that moderation? Does that sound average, limited, mediocre to anybody? And the reason I say this, there is a whole Christian world view attached to this moderation from this scripture, and it's not even what it actually says. You know, he even said, I would rather, I'd rather you were hot or cold than lukewarm. Well, lukewarm is the same, same definition as moderate. But listen to this in the Amplified. This is what it means. Let all men know and perceive and recognize your unselfishness, your considerateness, your forbearing spirit. The Lord is near. He is coming soon. This is talking about giving unselfishness is generosity giving considerateness how you how you treat other people put them first give and he said let it be known to all all share it with all people give and be generous wow that's the opposite of what people have taken and built a false doctrine off of it the living bible says let everyone see you are unselfish and considerate in all you do now, I talked some uh, just, just a second ago about this, and I'm just going to turn. You don't even have to turn. In Genesis 13, 1 and 2, it says in the Amplified, So Abram went up out of Egypt, God told him, he and his wife and all that he had, and Lot, his nephew, with him into the south country of Judah. Now, Abram was extremely rich in his heart and had warm and fuzzy feelings when he thought about God. No, extremely rich in livestock, in silver, and gold. Now, you'll notice if you read about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all through here, God, Joseph, God keeps bringing it up. He keeps bringing up the gold and all the natural stuff, you know? Why does he constantly do that? Because that's the point. He, it, notice he didn't just say rich because then people would say, well, that just means rich on the inside. Preachers everywhere would be saying, that doesn't mean rich. That means rich on the inside. So God just said, I'm putting it all in there. Livestock, silver, gold, donkeys, camels, all of it. Rich in stuff. Everybody say stuff. So uh, not rich in his heart, rich in things. Our father in the faith, Abraham. The Bible says, look at verse 5. But Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds, with the S, and tents. Tents is houses, plural. Flocks and herds. Now, Lot, this is interesting, uh, Lot went with him. It makes a difference who you run with. <laughs> you can tell by reading. If you read this whole story, the main reason and the only reason that Lot is blessed at all is because he's running with Abram. And he got rich just like Abram, just because he was running with him. Because what's on them gets on you. And when he broke off with Abram, he ended up in Sodom and in a mess. He should have stayed with Abram. 
It makes a big difference who you're with. Stay hooked with the people he hooks you with. There's a purpose behind it. Why? That's where your blessing is. That's where your increase is. That's where your success is. Does that matter? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, the land was not able, verse 6, not able to nourish and support them so they could dwell together for their possessions were too great for them to live Together. Who gave him too many? That's the kind of God he is. Always has been. Always will be. He's the same. Uh, now, that's Abraham. Now, over in Genesis 26, this is his son Isaac. Then Isaac, verse 12, sowed in that land and reaped the same year. They're in a drought. Nobody has any crops. They're, they're in the middle of, a, uh, of all this. In the same year, and he got a hundredfold return, and the Lord blessed him. And he began to prosper and continued prospering until he became very prosperous. <laughs> in case you got that confused. What kind of, yeah, he's prosperous in his heart. No, the next verse, he knew he was going to think that. For he had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and a great number of servants, so much so that his enemies envied him. Now, the next generation, Genesis 36, verse 6, then Esau. Uh, so uh, we're, we're talking here uh, about the next generation. Then Esau took his wife's son, his daughters, all the purse of his household, his cattle, all his animals, all his goods, which he had gained in the land of Canaan. And he went to a country away from the presence of his brother Jacob. This is Esau and Jacob, the next generation. For their possessions were too great for them to dwell together. And the land where they were strangers could not support them because of their livestock. That is uh, too many cows and too many camels and too many donkeys and too many employees. Too many. Everybody say too many. And then Galatians 3, 13, this is talking about you. That's Abraham, that's Isaac, that's Jacob. And he is our father in the faith. And the Bible says, walk in the steps of your father, Abraham. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, curses everyone that hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham, the same one, might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Here's the key to receiving it through faith. Verse 29, and if you be Christ, if you belong to Jesus, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You are an heir of the same exact, not a different one, the same blessing, the same God, the same Holy Spirit, the same. And it's the same blessing. Life more abundantly is what he had for Abraham. He had for Isaac. He had it for Jacob. Jesus said, I have it for you. Paul said in Galatians, this is what you're supposed to be walking in. Uh, it doesn't fall on you, though, just automatically because you're a Christian like ripe cherries falling off a tree because you can live your whole life and not walk in any of these blessings and you not become Superman until you get to heaven. But you can be it right now if you'll grab a hold of this and receive it by faith. We can live life more abundantly. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I pray if there's anyone in here that doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, they wouldn't walk out these doors without making a decision for you. And I ask you for that in Jesus' name. Just for a moment, this is the most important time of the whole service. This is the reason that we even exist that West Coast Life is here. And there's a lot of benefits that go along with it, with d discipling and raising people up and uh, g getting stronger and getting free and sowing the word in people's hearts. And uh, we're also a blessing to one another. But right now, if you're in here and you've never been saved, you've never received Jesus, you've never made him your Lord, never been born again. And if you didn't grow up in church and around church people, you may not even know what those terms mean. This is what all of them mean. They all boil down to this one thing. If you can't lay down to sleep at night and know beyond a shadow of a doubt, if you were to die in your sleep tonight, you'd go to heaven, you can know. This is not a hope so salvation. This is a no so salvation. 
we know that we pass from spiritual death to spiritual life. And we've all been given the greatest gift that he's given all of us is a free will. You can choose anything you want in this life. Even right now, you can choose him or you can reject him. It's completely up to you. But if you don't know for sure, and you want to, that's the first invitation. The second one is this. Maybe you have served, served the Lord, served God, or received him, but you've kind of been going your own way, doing your own thing, and so you want to rededicate your life. Make a fresh commitment to him. And the third invitation is this. If you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit, it's the most powerful thing that will happen to you in this life. Let me just say that at the end of the service, we have prayers that will be up here in front. And uh, uh, I mean, they are prayer warriors. They know how to pray heaven and earth together. If you need prayer for anything, you could come up. But especially if you answer uh, this call or want to know more about being filled with the Holy Spirit. The Bible talks about it in Acts 2 and several other places. It is a, a, an experience subsequent to salvation that will change your life. We're all going to pray a prayer in just a moment. But now, this is just for me so I can see, so I can pray for you. If that's you, you say, you know what? I, I don't know for sure, but I want to. I want to know that heaven's my home or I want to rededicate my life. Slip your hand up just real quick and back down for me. Anybody in the room? I see that. Thank you. You can put it down. Anybody else? I see that. You can put it down. I see that one. You can put it down. Anyone else before we all pray together? Might be some that are joining us online. We want you to join in also. Anyone else before we, before we move on here? I see that. Thank you. You can put it down. There might be some of you that maybe you wanted to, but for whatever reason you didn't. Why don't we all do it? Everybody in the room, let's lift one hand toward heaven. That's where our help comes from. Say this prayer, just repeat it after me, but mean it with your heart. Father God, I come to you in Jesus' name. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me with your precious blood and make me whole. I'll follow you all the days of my life in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, come on and give him thanks that heaven's your home.